Hey, hi. Uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Gene Martinez, and uh, welcome to the forum for this morning. We'll uh, continue to have people coming in, but uh, we're uh, very, very pleased to have Michelle Gross from the Communities United Against Police Brutality here with us this morning. And uh, I'm sure Michelle will uh, give us some information on her background and how she got into doing this uh, important work of uh, trying to hold the police accountable for uh, violence against uh, people of color and other people. Uh, so I will uh, turn it over to Michelle and let her go through her presentation and thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much, Jean. I appreciate that. Um, my name is Michelle Gross and I am one of the founders of the organization Communities United Against Police Brutality and I'm currently the president. And Communities United Against Police Brutality has been around for 19 years which is a pretty long time in this movement um, because this movement has, um, you, you've probably heard a lot about more of the more recent organizing, but we've been going at this a long time now, and so it's, like I said, a little bit unusual that way. Um, our organization is a local organization. We're based in, uh, we actually have an office in Minneapolis. We do our work in Minneapolis, St. Paul, and the surrounding suburbs, but we actually end up being all over the state because there really is no other group like us in the state of Minnesota, and very few groups like us in the country, in fact. So we do a lot of different things, um, and so we're kind of a different kind of group. Um, we do our work in three different areas. We provide advocacy for people dealing with the effects of police brutality. So these are people who have been brutalized by the police um, they, um, or, or family members of people who have been killed by police. And we do a lot of things to advocate for them. So we go into the... Um, we go into, go into courts with people. We help them gather evidence in their cases. We're real experts on the Data Practice Act, which is the act that allows us to get data from the government. And so we're real experts on that. And we use that to help us help people research their cases. Um, we pair people up with lawyers. Um, we ourselves are not lawyers, but we pair people up with lawyers, go to court with them, um, just anything that they need. You know, I've, um, I'm a retired nurse, and so one of the things that I do is I help people get their autopsy reports for their family members who were killed by police and the, and the pictures, and I review them because a lot of times the families don't want to, and I don't blame them. They shouldn't remember their loved one that way. So we just do a lot of different advocacy. And you know one of the things I think I forgot to mention? We're an all-volunteer organization. So we are doing this. We're running a 24-hour hotline with all volunteers and have for 19 years. So there is something to that. Um, and again, doing all this other work. I was just with a family last week, for example. They were trying to get their loved one's possessions back. And oftentimes the, um, the system, if you will, makes it quite hard for them to do that. And we were able to successfully get their, their loved one's possessions back and uh, in a way that also preserved the um, evidentiary value of, of the clothing, for example, and things like that. So we do a lot of things in that area because we have a lot of expertise in that area. Um, we, and, and we do all kinds of crazy things to assist survivors of police brutality. Um, for example, one man we were working with down in Newport, um, which is a little suburb of St. Paul, he was having all these problems because the police were harassing him all the time. So we threw a big party at his house, put a big sign up and said, you know, he put a big sign in his yard that said, welcome Communities United Against Police Brutality. We had a nice little barbecue at his house, a big party, and guess what? The cops took notice and they stopped bothering the guy. You know, things like that. So there's all kind of solutions for these types of problems. And so we do a lot of different things like that. We also engage in political activity to get at the underlying causes of police brutality because we don't just want to put Band-Aids on things all the time. We want to actually address the causes. So we've done several things like that. Um, we had a class action lawsuit in 2001 that we won in 2006 that put cameras in all the squad cars in Minneapolis, for example. We are the organization that has been pushing for police officers to carry their own professional liability insurance. We had a campaign in Minneapolis. We're, we're doing one now in St. Paul. Um, we have um, sued the city multiple times. Um, and we've actually won five lawsuits against Minneapolis when they tried to withhold police complaint data, which is public data. And, you know, all governments like secrecy, and they will work hard to keep their little secrets. And we have been busting that open over and over again and um, you know, going after them to keep them from keeping important information that we need to do our work, but also that the community is entitled to. 
from being secret. So we do a lot of different things like that. We do we uh, put together protests when someone is killed by police. We put together memorial services for families. We um, have family dinners. Just every kind of thing that you can do that will in some way make a political change. We were very involved and got rid of the lurking and spitting ordinances in Minneapolis, for example, because homeless people were the targets of those, of those ordinances. And what we learned, we, did a, we ran a study of homeless people and homeless arrests in Minneapolis. And what we learned is that homeless people were being arrested every 2.1 hours in Minneapolis, a homeless person is arrested. We're redoing that study now, and what we're finding is that it's actually happening even more now. So we've got to get at those underlying causes and figuring out what's going on there. So these are things we do. Our work is uh, generally evidence-based. We try, you know, we don't like to just go in and say, hey, y'all ought to think about doing this solution, you know, without any study behind it and whether it's going to work. So we do a lot of evidence-based um, activity where we're trying to really study a problem. Um, for example, we are in the middle right now, we have a big mental health working group that's going on where you know we are trying to get at the issues around policing and mental health. I don't know if you folks know this or not, but in the state of Minnesota, we had in the, in the three week period between November and December of 2018, last year, so not that long ago, there were five people killed in the state of Minnesota by police officers who were in the throes of a mental health crisis. This is a serious problem. And so we are taking that problem seriously and again, studying it, looking for solutions. Um, and some of the solutions are not obvious. You know, there are things you have to dig deeply into. And um, so that's one of the efforts we're going to, we're about to release a white paper on that and start meeting with police departments and trying to get them to change the way that they in, um, interact with mental health, you know, with people in mental health crisis. So a lot of kinds of things like that where we're trying to solve the problem or get at the underlying cause of the problem. So we do a ton of that type of activity. And then the third area that we work in is education. We go school to school. We go to homeless shelters, food shelves, needle exchanges, any place, any churches a lot of time, any place anybody will have us, we will go because what we're trying to do is teach people about their rights in dealing with police and how to have safe interactions. We are not against police. We don't hate the police or anything like that. And in fact, some of our members, one of our members in particular, is a retired police officer. But in 26 years of working as a police officer, he never brutalized anybody. And he doesn't like police brutality. He's a lawyer also. And he actively works hard against police brutality and is one of our core members. So it's not like we say, oh, you know, we don't like the cops. What we want is good policing. And what we don't want is bad policing. And so it's a very simple, you know, concept. Bad policing is bad for the community. It's bad for the officers. And it doesn't serve, you know, anybody well. So we really, really work at, like I said, um, getting at the underlying causes of police brutality and helping preserve people's lives and safety. So these are, these are pretty big things. Um, and so in, this, in the context of how we work, do our work, people come to us um, through the hotline. Also, these days, it's through Facebook and web page and all that. You know, I wish people wouldn't contact us through Facebook because it's not very private. But people do what they do, right? They find us any way they can find us. And they will contact us and tell us about the issue that they're having. And we will then have them come to a meeting tell their story. So our meetings are interesting because people come and tell their stories. You know, they tell their situation to us. And then we start to unpack that situation and figure out, okay, well, let's go downtown and get that police report. Let's go to the courts and get that warrant application. You know, whatever it is that we need to do for that person. Oh, you need a lawyer? Let's get you set up with, you know, our list of lawyers. And we maintain a very well um, manicured, if you will, list of attorneys that do very good work. And we go to court and watch them do their work so we know they're good. And so we'll um, hook people up with attorneys. We'll do all of those kinds of things. Go to court with people because court's a really nasty place to go by yourself. Especially if you are a person of color, you're going to see a white jury. You're going to see a white judge. You're going to see a white prosecutor. And maybe your own attorney is white. And you will be the only person of color in that courtroom typically. Except when we go there with you. So we will, you know, show up at court with people, help them understand the system and the processes. But it all starts with people coming to our meetings. And when people come to our meetings, um, they're going to learn about all the projects we're working on and things like that. They're going to get a, a hearing for their case. They're going to talk about their case. We're going to unpack it. And then we're going to very sneakily 
not so sneakily because we're honest about it, um, we're going to very ever so slightly get people involved in doing the work. And here's why that's important. The reason I got into this work 30 years ago is because I am the survivor of a very bad incident of police brutality. And one of the things that I can tell you is that you basically, it is the most disempowering experience you can have. You have no control over your body. You have no control over your legal situation. You may have charges against you. It may affect your housing. It may affect your job. All of those kinds of things are affected by being brutalized by the police. There's a big lot of sort of downstream effects. And you're very, very disempowered. Just being in that situation is really awful for most people. The only way out of that situation is to do active work on your own case and to get involved in the movement. But at the same time, we can't say, oh, geez, I'm so sorry you got beat up by the cops. Isn't that terrible? Now join the movement. These people need legs under them. They need to have some support system, some you know, lawyering and some whatever else they need in that circumstance. So you got to put some legs under them, but you got to not be a social service agency. We're all about social justice, and that's a very big difference. You know, we'll help people, but they got to come to the meeting and get it, and they've got to get involved because the, being involved is the healing. And I know that from my own personal experience, and I think it's extremely important to get people in that door and doing work on their own cases or other people's cases. I, for example, was talking to a family um, that the, 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 the young woman who died in Itasca County Jail, because we also do jail death cases as well, um, but, and jail brutality cases. But this young woman who died, she literally died last Wednesday. Last Wednesday. And I was on the, we were on the phone, she found us, we were on the phone with her right away talking about what she needs to do and all of that, because we're kind of like the first responders for people that die at the hands of law enforcement. And um, she, you know, right away needed, you know, she was trying to figure out like what paperwork and this and that, and I was able to help her with some of that burden and relieve some of that for her. But she needed to be engaged in getting that data and doing that. I can't just say, oh, I'll get all that for you, because that doesn't empower her. She needs to feel like she's got a place in this whole thing so that she can begin to regain her personal power. And think about, this was this young, this, this woman's daughter that died in the jail. And she's, you know, she's grieving, she's in bad shape, you know, she's just horrified, and, um, and yet she does need to pick up her feet and start doing some things because, again, that is how she's going to be able to have any measure of control over the situation and regain her power. And so those things are really important to us and very core values for our organization. And that's basically kind of how we operate in, in the world of uh, uh, policing. Now, victim advocacy or survivor advocacy, we always call people that live through their experience survivors and people who died in their experience victims. Okay, and that's a real, for us, that terminology is important again because we're trying to re empower people who have experience police brutality. So that's like an important dynamic for us. Um, but victim advocacy or survivor advocacy or whatever you want to call it is an important piece of our work. But again, we're not social services. We are social justice. And so I don't want to be sticking band-aids on things the rest of my life. I want to be changing things. And that's a lot of the work that we do. Um, so that kind of gives you a bit of an overview of our organization. And one of the things that I told these folks when I did this is I said, I want people to be able to ask questions all along the way and not just have like, oh, here's my section to talk and now it's your section to talk. So does anybody have any questions? Yes, sir. Well, let's let, let's let Jean get over to you with the uh, microphone there. Uh, what is the name of the organization? Our organization is Communities United Against Police Brutality. And like I said, we've been around for 19 years, so it's a little bit unusual that way as well because a lot of organizing, 19 years ago, there wasn't very much organizing happening around police brutality in this country. Um, and so we kind of like, we have, con I have connections literally of uh, 30 years of doing this with people all over the country. But honestly, this was not being done a lot 19 years ago. So it's, it's, a, it's a very unique situation. Yes, sir. How do, you, how do municipal police departments compared to sheriff's departments in that respect and uh, both locally and generally and uh, if there's a difference then how do you account for it? You know it, it, that, that's a very good question and it's a mixed bag 
The answer is it's a mixed bag. It depends, you know, a lot of culture of any organization is dependent on the leader of that organization. Um, you know, culture is a top-down phenomenon in any organization, whether you're talking about, you know, the, a job site you might go to or any type of thing like that. And so much depends on the leaders of those organizations and what they will tolerate in terms of the conduct of their employees. And so um, we have found, for example, that some very small police departments have excellent cultures. Wyoming PD is a great example. They have a very, very good culture there. Um, the police chief is very much into working with the community. If you ever go, if you ever get a chance, go on Wyoming PD's Facebook page. It, it gives you a good flavor for the way that that police chief operates that department. They do all these virtual ride-alongs and all of this stuff. They're very engaged with the community. What city? Wyoming, P Wyoming, Minnesota. Um, by contrast, we're dealing with a group, we actually met with these women, um, a couple of women um, out of Itasca County who were having a lot of problems with sheriff, with the sheriff's department and major corruption that was happening and harassment of a lot of members of the community. And we worked with those folks and helped them start a group up there, which is great because they're a little too far for us, you know. So it was really great that they got their group going and they have a good group going now. And they are dealing with a lot of corruption up there and a lot of issues, but they're actually educating their community and the community is getting involved. And that sheriff almost lost his, um, his election in this last election, and I don't think he's going to survive this next, you know, I think he'll get to the end of this, and I think he'll get booted out because of the levels of corruption and the way that they're exposing it. So it's a real mixed bag, and it just depends, you know. Um, that's two examples of two more or less rural places, you know. And then within Minneapolis or St. Paul, um, the chiefs are trying, but there's some things that they're not, I feel like they're not doing well enough in terms of enforcing the appropriate culture within their departments. But we meet with them. You know, we meet with them on a regular basis and try to get them to do take up different pieces of what we're trying to get them to do to improve the situation. Hi, Michelle. My name Hi. is Kathy McMahon. I live in Minneapolis, and I I have been aware of police brutality with people I know. Um, and um, what what can you say about police training? And do you have any sort of like are there bright lights of where? I've, I've kind of heard some negative things about some of the training programs at, this, at like Mankato and just some of the culture and some of the police training. Yeah. I'm wondering if there's anything you can point to as promising or something that's already working in terms of right. a, a, a good approach to police training. Thank you for asking that question. That's a great question about training. You know, one of the things that people, when they see that there's a problem, practically their first go-to is we need more training. And I happened to, when I was working as a nurse, I was also the training manager for a large healthcare organization, and I have a, a, the better part of a master's degree in adult ed. And one of the biggest things I always said to people is that training is not always the solution, and you have to decide when it is and when it isn't. And a lot of the issues are not training, they're culture. And so, you know, what you allow your employees to do, they're going to do. You know, some employees are mature and they take care of business and they do things right. Other employees need a little more guidance than that, right? And those are not training issues. Those are management issues. Um, and so, you know, a lot of what people try to put out as training, oh, we just need more training. You know, it, it was really, it, here's a great example. There was the Metro Gang Strike Force. Who remembers that in the room? A few of us, right? The Metro Gang Strike Force. It was a multi-jurisdictional strike force, so-called, that basically went around um, to people who may have been involved in gangs, probably weren't or whatever, and literally it was like every Latino and African-American kid was fair game for this, this outfit. And they were literally stopping kids, stealing their phones, stealing their, you know, um, just anything, their money, whatever. Uh, they stole people's cars. They stole, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. They stole um, electronics that went in people's houses and stripped their houses of electronics. All of that was going back to the, the Metro Gang Strike Force headquarters, and it was never even seeing the property room. They would literally take that stuff home and give it away to their family members. Do you guys remember that? And there was a big investigation, and it was like, yes, this happened. Yes, this was terrible. And then none of the cops got disciplined for it. Not a single police officer got disciplined except one, because we forced that one. And I'll tell you about that in a second. But... What um, ended up happening as a result of that is there was a class action lawsuit. People that got things stolen from them got a little bit of money toward it. And then the big bulk of the money was preserved for some kind of training development. It's like, wait, you need to tell cops not to steal? I think I learned that in kindergarten. 
Just saying, right? So it was weird that they thought the training was the solution because again, that's a culture issue, not a training issue. So um, you know, so you know, there are some trainings that are good, um, and then there's some that are very, very bad. We have been working very hard to get rid of a training that we call fear-based training. Anybody ever heard of that concept, fear-based training? This is the things like bulletproof warrior and all of this kind of stuff that teaches cops that you're, you know, people are, you know, ready to kill you at every turn, and you know, they they even have these videos where they they call them shoot don't shoot videos, where the video pops up. And it's like the person has to, the cop has to make a decision whether to shoot the person or not. And the last person that pops up is an older woman. I mean, clearly older, gray hair and all this stuff. And then they almost always don't shoot. And then the woman shoots them. So it's to put things into people's heads about how dangerous policing is. And that's a, such a ridiculous concept because date, uh, policing doesn't even hit the top 20 of dangerous jobs. It's like 21 or something. It doesn't even hit the top 20, but they're taught that at any moment, you know, you could be slaughtered in the street, so you better shoot first and all that. And that is the exact training that Euronimo Yanez had before he killed Philando Castile. He had 56 hours of that training. He had two hours of de-escalation training. Two hours. And that's why he grotesquely overreacted. And every officer that I know that's an honest officer says that he grotesquely overreacted, that he should have never been an officer if that was his attitude. It is exactly the same training that um, that uh, Schmidt, um, I'm trying to think his first name now, um, Schmidt had, yeah, uh, no, um, doesn't matter. But anyway, Schmidt, the officer, um, had when he gunned down Thurman Blevins on the north side. In fact, he is not just a, a recipient of that training, he is a trainer of fear-based training. And um, that training is dangerous. It's not based on any kinds of sound principles or evidence-based best practices. It needs to go. So that's a training we actually have been hammering away at the post board to make them ban. So you know, so not all not all training is good. There are a few bright lights. They finally, um, what, 2009, uh, 2019, they finally got around to deciding that cops in Minnesota should be trained on how to investigate sexual assaults. You know, we were part of a group of a work group around the, the training at the post board, post board being the state licensing agency for police. And we were part of a, a, a group to look at all the training. And so that was one of the things that came out of that work was finally we're going to have a, rec a, a requirement for training for officers who, who do sexual assault investigations to actually be trained in how to do it. You know, that's so backward that we didn't have it. And I can't believe it's 2019. We're just getting to it. So that kind of thing. I see lots of hands popping around, so it's hard for me to see who is next. I'm just wondering if you have any interaction with the Native community? Very I know much that so. women especially in the yes. Native community are... Yes. Um, I worked very hard, um, and our organization worked very hard, for, for example, with the Danielle Longcrow case. And this was a case where police raided the home based on some bad information from a so-called informant, you know, um, and there's different levels of informant, but this was supposed to be one of the confidential, reliable informants, really good one, right? And they, based on bad information, they broke into this, um, this young woman's apartment in Little Earth. And um, this was very early in the morning, like 7 o'clock in the morning. Not, I guess that's not that early, but it was on a Sunday morning. They broke in, and she, Danielle, uh, and her husband lived in the, in the apartment. She was eight and a half months pregnant, roughly. Um, she, her mother and father lived in the apartment and two brothers lived in the apartment. So it was a big apartment. And the police broke in. They woke up the brothers by hitting them in the head with the butt of a gun. You know, imagine laying in your bed and you, that's how you get awakened. Um, they, she was in the shower. They dragged her out of the shower naked and very pregnant, put her on her belly and started putting their knees into her back bruised her from head to toe. She ended up um, going into labor at, at Southdale. They just took all kinds of pictures of her and, and, and all her bruises and everything. So it was really a terrible deal. Then they were in the, she had put some food, you know, she'd been cooking breakfast. They were in the kitchen eating her breakfast, eating the family's breakfast. And they roused the parents in a very inappropriate way as well, like basically rolled them out of bed. And um, basically searched the whole apartment, found nothing. Then a, another cop comes sauntering in and opens up a toy chest and said, oh, look, here's some Mexican cocaine, whatever that means. I didn't know there was such a thing, Mexican crack or something like that. He claims to find drugs, you know, which he clearly planted because they hadn't been found before. 
And this family, you know, and they were living in Little Earth at the time. And Little Earth is a joint federal and tribal housing unit. And in housing units, in federal housing units, if you get found with drugs, you get kicked out. They literally, this happened on a Sunday morning, and they were told they had to be, they were being evicted Monday morning. So, you know, first thing we did was immediately get a lawyer on that. So we got them a month extension to be able to move somewhere else. Because how do you move a family that big with elderly parents, you know, on a day's notice? Who has ability to find an apartment in a day, especially on a Sunday? So we were able to get them an extension, all this stuff. We hooked them up with a lawyer. They had a very successful lawsuit. Um, and we, you know, like I said, we worked extensively with that family. So this is some of the kinds of stuff we do. And we do, a, I do a lot of Know Your Rights trainings in Little Earth and lots of other places. So yeah, we do a lot of good bit of work in uh, the American Indian community. Absolutely. Okay, this gentleman. Do you think the recent change in sheriffs in Hennepin County is a step in the right direction? Absolutely. We were very pleased to see Dave Hutchinson uh, become the, the, the sheriff in Hennepin County. And what we did was, um, I, we actually, as soon as he was elected, we don't endorse candidates, but as soon as he was elected, we had a meeting with him right away. I was very pleased with the things that he agreed to, um, to take up in the jails. Um, and I've been, been quite happy um, with, with them. Things that we pay attention to, for example, are lack of medical care in the jails. So we get a lot of phone calls from people saying, my son's been in the jail and they're not letting him have his heart medicine or, you know, his, um, his AIDS cocktail or whatever it is. And then, um, you know, we've been able to go, we'll go down there sometimes and make a demand, demand in person. You know, if it gets bad enough, we'll make demands in person. But, um, I haven't had to do that with him at all. Um, the, he's running, he's doing a great job running the jail and he is not acting as an ICE agent, which is a very big deal to us because we don't want them to do that either. So he's not acting like they're going to be holding all these people for ICE and all that. He got rid of that, and that was one of the biggest things that was really a big difference between him, him and Stanek. Stanek was way gung-ho to be holding all these people for ICE, and, and Hutchinson, Hutch does not do that. So it's been a huge change for people. So we've really liked that. Yes, sir. Uh, could you comment on the various de-escalation trainings that are offered Crisis Prevention Institute and uh, various others, San Jose College. Yeah, I'd be delighted to talk about that. Um, de-escalation training is different than CIT. So I'll talk about CIT in a second. Um, de-escalation training was just um, passed two sessions ago at the legislature. Um, with a lot of money appropriated for it. They gave them a big hunk of money for this. And this was sort of the response to Philando Castile and all the protests and things like that. Um, we haven't seen the training yet. It's just getting started now. So we don't know the quality of it. We don't know enough about the quality. I'm a little bit concerned about some of the purveyors of the training um, because one of the things the Post Board does not do a good job with is um, regulate and examine the, the providers of the training. You know, so some of the um, de-escalation training is being given by the same outfits that do the fear-based training. Oh, great. So that's a huge issue. We've been raising, you know, a lot about that, you know. Besides. What's that? Who decides? Um, actually, um, they don't. What they're supposed to do is they're supposed to, you know, like all professional boards, they're supposed to um, accept applications from a organizations basically to be providers of training and then they're supposed to provide outlines and syllabi and so forth and approve the training. But the post board, I swear, it's like a rubber stamp agency. Anything that comes through there, they're rubber stamping it and they don't care. Um, and it's, it, what's that? The post board. Police. police officer standard and training board. It's the licensing agency for police, uh, for law enforcement officers in the state of Minnesota. And they do a terrible job. They just rubber stamp everything that comes through and comes down the pike. We are at their meetings. They only meet once every three months. And we are at their meetings every three months, you know, religiously, just basically um, telling them this is not acceptable. Can we get the post board? Get, can we get the governor to take action? That would bring the post board falls under the Public Safety Commission. And to try to get them to do anything, we had a whole issue. You know, I mentioned the Metro Gang Strike Force before, right? We filed 31 complaints with the post board because you're supposed to be able to file complaints with the post board. We filed 31 complaints on behalf of 29 people. Um, and we, it wasn't like 30, 31 pieces of paper. We brought in bankers boxes of evidence 
and of uh, videos of you know people being brutalized by these uh, Metro Gang Strike Force members and all of this stuff. We brought all this stuff in, and they threw it out. They did nothing with it. And, and they have a mandate. They're, under their state statute, they are supposed to be working on these issues. And, you know, they're supposed to investigate and all this stuff. They did nothing with this stuff. And then we wrote letters to the governor. We wrote letters to the Public Safety Commission, to the legislature. We spoke at their, they have, they have a, a, every two years a, a legislative hearing about their budget and such. We went and spoke out at that thing. We have been, and we've done protests in front of the post board. They are almost immovable. I think we're going to have to sue them at some point because they're almost immovable. They will not um, address people's complaints. And then when we did a data practice request to see the complaints that they've received from members of the public, including ours, we expected to get ours back plus a bunch more because we knew people that had filed complaints. They kept telling us, we have no data responsive to your request. Meaning, in other words, we threw your flipping complaints out. So that they, they're just useless in terms of that kind of stuff. Now, you asked me about CIT also, and I don't want to forget that question. CIT, do, does anybody know what that is? Crisis Intervention Training. It's a program that's been going on a pretty long time, I'd say about 20 years or so, and they, um, they, it trains police officers supposedly on how to address mental illness, you know, mental health crises. The, the issue is this. It's been an okay training. It's about eight hours long, but the reality is that people who are in mental health crisis, an eight-hour training is not going to get it, okay? What it does is it makes officers cocky about them thinking they know how to deal with this stuff. Um, and that's been a problem. And some of the police departments, initially they had only certain officers trained and those were always the ones that responded. But, you know, it's hard to manage that when you have a big city. So you need a lot of people trained. And so some of the departments were giving out these certificates like they were candy, you know, and all of this. And very little... Um, very little kind of, um, you know, attention to the quality of the training and things like that. There is an advanced training in CIT. So what, 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 uh, and that gives people, you know, like it's more like a 40 hour training. It's a more real training. A study showed that officers that got the eight hours of CIT training thought that they were well qualified to address mental health issues. Officers who got the 40 hour training said, I am not qualified at all. I can recognize it, but I can't do any more than that. I want a professional working with me, a mental health professional. So knowing more makes you know what you don't know in that case. And so that was an interesting study. Um, and so what we're recommending in our work is to um, not just have the kind of thing that we have now in Minneapolis, which is what they call a co-responder model. But the co-responders are very separately siloed. So it's like the police go to a scene, they might recognize that there's a mental health component to that scene, and then they will decide if they want to call in COPE, the local or the countywide uh, mental health crisis mobile team. Um, and so they'll decide. What we're talking about is moving that decision-making up higher at the dispatch level, doing what's called dispatch triage, where sometimes the police are not even going to be sent to this stuff. Instead, COPE will be the primary responder. So we're looking at those kinds of models. We, we haven't reached an absolute conclusion on these things, but where there's not a public safety issue involved, we think that it should be a mental health provider and not uh, a CIT-trained police officer who's got maybe a little tiny bit of knowledge, but you know nowhere near enough to actually do a good job with the situation. So I see lots of other hands. Uh who is it that supervises recruitment and the kind of the supervisory structure over police? In Minneapolis, so every department's different, right? But in Minneapolis, HR, human, re, uh, human resources for the city, oversees recruitment and um, not supervision, but oversees recruitment. Supervision happens at the sergeant level in Minneapolis. So you've got these sergeants, they're like the frontline supervisors to many officers. Um, what has happened in the past that we do like that Rondo corrected at our suggestion, what had happened in the old days is that whoever was the sergeant that was on duty at that particular shift, all the people in that shift reported to that person at that precinct. And basically, so you never had one supervisor watching you. And we thought that was problematic. We're like, well, how do you do performance reviews? You know, they'd all sit together and say, yeah, Joe's a good guy, Bill's a good guy, Susie's a good guy, you know, a good person, whatever, you know. And that's how they would do their performance reviews. And we were like, that means that nobody's accountable to anybody, really. 
And that was problematic for us. So um, we said, somebody needs, and, and it was probably problematic for the officers too. It's like, you know, confusing. This guy wants you to do it this way. That person wants you to do it that way. You know, it was probably really confusing for them too. So we said, this, the, you, now that you're in, you have to change this. And to his credit, he did. We said, you have to have people, a person reporting to a person, even if they're not on the same shift together, they know what phone, come, you know, they can call up or whatever. But you have to have a person that's, oversees that person and it has to be the same one all the time. It can't be switch it around based on who's working that day. You know, so we, we were able to get him to do that. And that I think has helped improve some of the culture of the department. So yes, I'd like gonna... to preface uh, my remarks with just a little story. Sure. I have a little friend whose name is Dimitri and he was about three or between three and four years of old age. He was out in front of their, of his grandmother's house with whom he lives. And he was on his little scooter. And uh, as she was watching from the window, uh, a police car uh, pulled up, uh, got out, uh, talked with him just a little bit, and then went on their way. Dimitri came running in very happy, and he proclaimed to his grandmother, uh, policeman, policeman, he no shoot. And then showed her wow. a coupon for Dairy Queen that they gave him to get a Dairy Queen. Okay. It was a, a positive uh, interaction if you look at it, but also one that makes you almost cry with uh, the response. Yeah, um, sad. Do you see any um, a hope in the younger policemen, uh, policewomen being uh, taken on the force, a different cultural, um, you know, history? And, uh, I, some I do, yes, yes. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut off your question, but yeah, some we do. Um, there was a group of Minneapolis police officers that were so bad. We, people on the north side called them the jump out boys. And they drove around in a, in a white van, and they pull up in front of a house, and they would all come out of the out of the vehicle, like, uh, uh, you know, like this, doing this uh, 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 thing, you know, and, and with their guns and all this stuff. And they would just raid a house, and it scared the wits out of the community. And so um, for a long time, and it was the same group of guys over and over again. And um, so the community hated the Jump Out Boys. All of them have aged out of policing. So when you age out of policing in this world, you age out at about 55 you get to retire at about 55 or 57, something like that. So you age out. And so a bunch of the worst of the Minneapolis police um, aged out. And when I tell you the worst, it's, it was not just anecdotal, but some of these guys have ha had 40, 50, 60 complaints against them. Now, I have been a manager um, in my jobs. And one of the things that I know is if I hear a complaint the first time, I'm going to say, okay, what's your side? What's your side? And I'm going to try to correct it with my employee, but I just want to know both sides because there is always two sides to things, right? If I hear that similar or same complaint about an employee a second time, I'm going to say, hmm, we're developing a pattern here. There's a problem. I'm going to do some remedial work with that person, try to train them away from that conduct or put some kinds of boundaries and things like that. When I hear that complaint the first time, I'm starting to think about now we're doing a written advisement, you know, uh, now we're getting ready to suspend, now we're going to get ready to, dis, you know, we're going to advance a discipline through, you know, a progressive disciplinary scheme, right? That's what everybody's job places do, right? As you go from little to big, right? You don't just fire somebody, oh, I got a bad compliment or a bad complaint about you, you're fired. You have a union. Yeah, well, you know, some people do. Yeah, the police have a union. My, my people were never unionized, but I did work in union environments with other people. So basically, um, you know, you go through that kind of stuff. These guys had 40, 50, 60 complaints, and they were still working for the Minneapolis police. I don't know any other job where you can keep your job. I don't know any job where you can cost your employer hundreds of thousands of dollars for lawsuits and keep your job. I mean, you know, in nursing world, you cost your employer 10 grand, you are going to have a hard time working for that employer or any other employer because your name's going to be all over town talking about that you were you made this mistake or whatever. You're going to have a hard time recovering from that. And in policing world, you can cost all kinds of money and still keep your job. So we had a bunch of those guys. They have aged out. So the culture is improving a little. We still have lots of issues, and there's still lots of cops acting with impunity in the Minneapolis Police Department. And we do meet with Rondo about those kinds of cops every other month to try to get at the underlying causes again. How thorough is the vetting of law enforcement uh, recruits, uh, psychological profiling, and that sort of thing? Depends on the place. It is a requirement that they are vetted psychologically, but I can tell you that it's very poorly done in Minneapolis. 
they, for a while there, um, they had, you know, a psychologist, I mean, a psychiatrist, and actually the state law says it has to be an employment psychologist, so they were violating state law. But not only did they have the psychiatrist, it's kind of this weird scheme, but this guy was a racist. He, you know, we, we had people coming in, new recruits from Chicago and other places that, you know, had worked as police officers, experienced police officers in other places. And if they were people of color, he just would rule them out. There was a lot of racism going on. Since then, they've hired a firm that is psychologists and psychiatrists mixed together, but they had no employment screening experience. And we're just going, Rondo, why did you do that? And he was the one that hired them. So we're kind of slapping our foreheads about that one, and we're trying to figure out what that's going to look like, and we're watching it, because this is a fairly, this happened maybe um, tail end of last year. So I'm watching it to see if we are getting some better recruits in, but we were having a big problem for a long time in Minneapolis. St. Paul seems to do a bit better job of vetting their people. Um, you know, different departments, it's, it depends on what they do, but it is a state post-board requirement that they be psychologically screened. If you could have uh, 50 postcards and 50 phone calls go to somebody, who would they go to and what would they say? It would go to the post board and it would say stop fear-based training now. That's exactly what it would say. That is the hugest issue in terms of cops panicking, not knowing what to do, and, and people dying. So that would be a huge thing for us. Could you tell me what they, the police would call fear-based training? Because I don't, do they call it fear-based training, or is that what you're calling? Well, it? we... if we want to send postcards, we need the right name. Right, of course. Um, we, they are starting to call it that. Uh, we coined the term about three years ago when we started talking about this issue really actively with the post board. Um, there's different names for the training in terms of the actual course names. There was like Bulletproof Warrior, and now they just call it Bulletproof because they don't like the warrior part of it. Or, you know, there's different agencies and different outfits, for-profit outfits that are, you know, putting forward this training. If you would ever see the training, one of the things I'd love to do at a point, if we're going to do any work with this, is show you the videos of the trainers and the kinds of training that they do. It is astounding. Um, it's based on, on false theory. Um, one of the main purveyors of this, their theory behind it is that the, um, is that he, he was in the military. He's never been a cop. He was in the military and he thought that soldiers were hesitant to shoot. So he wanted to do things to make them more ready to shoot people and not, and to dehumanize people and all this stuff. And that's literally what this training does. It is just sickening. And it is, has no place in modern policing whatsoever. And so getting rid of that would be just huge. And so, like I said, we started talking about it, calling it fear-based training. And then that has become the term all over the country that academics are using and even police departments are using. So, yeah, we can, we can call it that. And then people will know what we're talking about. And we can give examples. Yeah. Well... I love your questions, by the way. I'm really happy with the questions you folks are asking. It gives me a lot of chance to talk about things that are great to talk about. My comment is, what sort of things do you do, or is there any hope of working out to the Sheriff's Association or the MPPOA? You know, the Police Officers Union has at least historically been the source of a lot of the restrictions that take away power from regulatory agencies. So. Any thoughts on dealing with that? Sure. My perception is they've been the biggest problem. Well, that's a lot of people's perception. And here's the interesting part. We have reviewed the, um, the union contracts for Minneapolis, which, by the way, is no small matter because it's about 160 pages. And we've gone through it you know, with a fine-tooth comb. We've also reviewed the St. Paul um, Police Department's union contract. And you know what? The contracts aren't actually the problem. People say they are, and, and, and the city councils will say, well, I can't do that because the union contract won't let me. That is bunk. So this is the kind of thing when I talk about evidence-based, you've got to dig in and find out what the deal is. You know what they call for in the police union contract in Minneapolis? Because everybody says, oh, Bob Kroll, he's terrible. Yeah, and he is a pretty terrible person. No question about that. We can have a whole workshop just on that. But 
But the reality is that the union contract isn't all that bad. It calls for progressive discipline. It gives people rights to arbitration, which, listen, every union contract has those elements. It, and it outlines things like shifts and, um, and hours and pay and benefits and stuff. And we're not interested in touching any of that hours or benefits stuff. That doesn't really change policing. So we're not interested in that. We're not trying to take anything away from them. You know, if they're, they, they get paid well and they deserve to get paid well, that's fine. We're done with that. We don't mess with that. The contract isn't the problem. What is the problem is the arbitration system. And actually, they're not even really the problem. Here's what happens. This is a great um, example. In St. Paul, there was an incident with a man named Frank Baker. You guys know, have you heard that case, the Frank Baker case? This was a case where a 54-year-old man stopped on the side of the road. He pulled up into a little parking lot of a, of a place looking for an address. And he gets out of his car and he's looking for an address. Unbeknownst to him, the St. Paul police had been called and they had um, they were looking for a group of kids. They'd been called because it was a group of kids fighting, supposedly. And they had come through the area and driven all around the few blocks around and never saw those kids. Never found anybody fighting or anything like that. You know, who knows, maybe they were and they moved on or just who knows, right? Mr. Baker gets out of his car. He's walking around trying to figure out the address. And all of a sudden, a police dog attacks him. And it was literally gnawing off the back of his leg. And he's on the ground. He doesn't know why this is happening. He's laying on the ground going, please, please. And he's digging his hands in the ground. And the dog is literally spinning him around. If you see the video, it would make you very unhappy. Um, and so this is going on. And, this, uh, and that police officer, that the dog handler, was named Brian Ficadenti. Then another guy comes up and um, basically starts kicking him in his sides, fractures his ribs on both sides, collapsing both lungs. But for very good paramedic care, he would have died because when your lungs collapse, you can't get oxygen in to your, um, into your body. And so you can quite easily die from that. Um, Ficadenti was disciplined. Um, oh, and I should mention that Frank Baker sued and the city of St. Paul paid him $2 million for his injuries as they should. St. Paul, city of St. Paul, just like Minneapolis, is self-insured for police complaints, you know, police settlements and judgments in their complaints, okay? Um, they, they literally budget $800,000 a year for settling these kinds of complaints. So they basically, that Frank Baker case by itself used up two and a half years of their money, okay? City of St. Paul's in some deep trouble because they've got big lawsuits coming down the pike for another matter. But the, the man, so, so Ficadenti took his punishment, okay? The guy who stomped on Frank Baker and basically broke his ribs and all that was a guy named Brett Palkowicz. When Axtell became the chief, his second day on the job, the first thing he did on the second day on his job was fire Brett Palkowicz. I don't blame him. I thought it was a good move. Palkowicz decides to take it to arbitration. The arbitrator put him back on the job. And do you want to know why? He got put back on the job because they said he no officer that has ever engaged in that conduct has ever been disciplined by the department in the past. And they gave him six examples. Three of them were Palkowicz. Okay? Yeah, so... The big issue that police departments have is what we call past practices. There's this huge issue because you can't discipline because you didn't do it before, so now you can't discipline, so the next time you can't discipline again. It's a cycle. There is a mechanism. There is a special mechanism that's called disciplinary reset. We did the research. We developed the memorandum of exactly how you do a disciplinary reset. Yep. And we, we came up with that whole thing, and we started talking to the police departments about it. And Axtell, for example, they were talking about they were going to do a new use of force policy. And we were at those meetings where that was all being discussed because the use of force policy is the most important public-facing policy there is. So I want to be in that door at that table talking about that policy. So we were at those meetings, and, and he was just saying, you know, and I knew his history, and I knew what he'd been trying to do. He's actually a pretty good police chief. Um, and um, what he was trying to make happen, um, you know, by, by firing Popovich and changing that culture, he was, he was hamstrung because of the past practices of not disciplining. So I said, hey, why, why aren't you doing a disciplinary reset? He's like, what? Never heard of it. He came racing to the table to sit next to me, 
and we talked for a while, and then I issued him a memo. I wrote, we wrote a memo how to do this thing, the actual nuts and bolts of it. And that was incorporated into this um, use of force policy, which I think is very good. This is how you get at the culture. It ain't the sexy going in the streets protesting, though. We do that, too. It's not the hold up the signs, you know, and all of that, which are important things to do. I am not making fun of those things. I've done many of them myself. I've been to hundreds of protests. And they are necessary because protests are about awareness and pressure. But once you get done with the, making people aware and starting to apply pressure, you got to sit in that back room and get that other stuff done. And that's the piece that we take up, That w why we end up working with every other group that's working on police accountability in the area is because they know that we're like the policy wonks. You know, we'll go in and talk to these police departments. We went in and talked to Rondo about it, and he did a little bit with it. We're not super pleased with his efforts, but um, but Axtell adopted it wholeheartedly, and he feels like this is his salvation because now he's going to get to discipline, and when the chief cannot discipline, they have no power. They can't control the culture of their organization because they don't have any power. And this is a way to get past that. And so you have, we're looking, like I said, always for those creative solutions of how are we going to be able to um, affect real change and lasting change. And that's, a, I think, one of the good examples of that. Okay, thank you for an outstanding presentation. Oh, thank you. I want to say one more thing. I have one more minute to say one more thing. Uh, and that's this. We meet every Saturday at 1.30 at 4200 Cedar Avenue. I would invite you all to get involved if you're interested. I think it's a, a, a powerful way to um, take up this issue. And um, like I said, there's always a lot of work to be done at any given moment. And we're an all-volunteer organization. We'd love to have you. So thank you so much for having me this morning.